Once upon a time, there was a boy. Jestem tym przerażony. Terapia genowa to będzie terapia przyszłego człowieka. Może trochę dążymy do tego, żeby... Hi everyone, thank you for coming, thank you Eleni. So Wojtek Zielniewski is a Polish director and performer uh, and visual artist. Uh, I, I know Wojtek uh, yeah, once, uh, one year ago in, uh, in Poznan, in Poland, we were talking about uh, yeah, Zoom uh, and online uh, performances and few people said, yeah, I, you know, enter full screen, this is the best uh, online performance that I have seen. Then, oh, uh, interesting uh, to watch it, and then um, you yeah, find uh, we cooperate with uh, Vera Popova, and uh, she also say very good words about uh, about Wojtek, uh, and then we have uh, common experience in uh, laboratory about uh, Zoom digital performance, um, but. Uh, Wojtek also has another side. He's he also a philosopher uh, and done many uh, start experiments with different form of theater much uh, before than, yeah, than, than we have current lockdown. And uh, I can see the, is a, the motto, the motivation for me to, to provide this, this talk. Mm, uh, yeah, preparing for it, I was reading uh, your your interviews, Wojtek, and I like a phrase uh, that you told once to culture PL that a feeling of tragedy and hopelessness uh, define us more than what we actually uh, do. And uh, yeah, it's that I'm feeling like this. That I said that. Oh uh, on, on Polish, if I translate it correctly. <laughs> yes, yes, it's possible. Uh, but, but, but I like this because this feeling of tragedy that we currently survive, live uh, the whole world, and what, what can be non-scientific people yeah, could do in, this, uh, in these obstacles and what art people, what theater people could do, uh, and many of them I consider feel this hopelessness. Uh, but actually, we are doing something, and we have done something. So, why such shifts exist? So, my desire today to talk about what I uh, have done and what is uh, what uh, what is doing processing yeah, what a process is happening in this field currently and uh, you yeah, try to define ourselves through the through this live matters and uh, some tragedies that we have uh, but i want to have a first question to you Wojtek, about uh, your personal start how do you uh, Mad yet? Yeah. When? Well, what was? If it was some some events that you understand? Yes, yeah, that theater is something uh, important, and you want to do this, or how it was? Yes. Well, um, thank you for having me, Piotr, and thank you for this great introduction. Um, my story is maybe not very typical because I spent half of my life running away from theater. And now the other half is dealing with the fact that I'm here. So uh, I come from a theater family. My, my grandmother was a theater director and actress. Um, and my mother was, uh, well, when she was, when she was younger, she was, um, close to the Grotowski milieu. She wrote her masters about one of his uh, productions. Uh, but when I was a kid, she she organized or co-organized these really crazy theater festivals in Wrocław. And not only in Wrocław, but they were open theater festivals. So, uh, so it meant that all sorts of crazy, weird theater people who were left over from the 70s, um, who still had the courage and the energy to do things, 
kind of spilled over into the 80s, which is which was my childhood, and they and they would come to these festivals, and that was my education. So that was my main kind of uh, background and and the very kind of physical one. I mean, this is something which which I associate with norm, you know. <laughs> Um, and then there was, uh, I was moving further and further away from theater. And as I was growing up, I was more and more disappointed, not in a rational way, but I was just more and more often bored by theater or disappointed or, or kind of feeling that it's not for me. So, um, so I was looking around for other things and, and moving as I was growing up. Um, into high school and then and then university I moved to the humanities social studies I studied philosophy but I kept saying that I'm going to come back to theater eventually that I mean it feels like this may be a place where I will end up which was fairly gratuitous I didn't really have any you know concrete I didn't do any concrete things but then I ended up in Portugal and um, living there. And suddenly I had to define who I was. I just finished philosophy. I was also a, a skier for quite, um, uh, for quite some time, a skier as in doing competitive skiing and, and teaching as well, uh, coaching ch children. Um, but I had to decide what am I going to do and how I'm going to present myself. And I thought, well, you can't really present yourself as a skier. You can't really present yourself as a philosopher if you're not, you know, in the academia. And I didn't want that. And I have to find a way of making my living and a way of also defining my activity. So I thought, okay, well, the one thing I do remember is theater. I can try that. So I started just saying, I'm a theater director, which was pretty hardcore. And the first experience were pretty brutal um but um but then i started i started quickly having some rehearsals with some people who who spoke french because i spoke french i didn't speak portuguese at the time and i started studying as well i would go to any workshop that there was to learn but i wasn't interested in theater per se i was interested in everything around it so anything that is performance that is dance that is a movement that is visual, anything that is that kind of extends the idea of theater. And I was very lucky because I, I met a few amazing artists there uh, in Lisbon. And also I uh, took a course in device theater and that pretty much kind of defined my, my base you know, my, my, my starting point. So it's a long story to, because there's no single point, but uh, it, I think it shows you how, what a mess I have in my head in terms of, in terms of uh, kind of roots and origins. And as I understand, your first, uh, one of the first uh, theater performances, Mara Narratia, your little narration, small narration, about your grandfather, who is from Ukraine, yes, Tanis Khaviv, uh, currently one of Kivsk. Yes, most most of my family is actually both my my grandfather on my mother's side, and my father was also born in in Lviv or Lvov or Ivan Frankivsk, if you really insist. Um, so yes, uh, so I do have whenever I would. You know, in Portugal, there is a huge Ukrainian minority. And whenever I would meet a Ukrainian person, I would say, I'm also, my family is also from Ukraine. And they would go, really? And I said, yes, uh, they're Polish. And they would go like, okay. And then, yes, yes, we're from Ukraine. But then everyone was super friendly, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, in another interview, uh, you yeah, you tell a story, uh, tell the story of your grandfather, and he asked some citation from uh, Wittgenstein, and uh, yeah, research this knowledge and pain, how it's uh, combined. Uh, am I right that it was your first uh, performance? Oh. It was not my first performance overall because I started working as a director creator in Portugal but those performances stayed in Portugal. 
um, they won some awards actually it was you know I um, I was fairly recognized there uh, and that's how uh, there was a Polish theater at Warszawa who came to to Lisbon and they discovered that I exist because I was performing at the same time and they invited me to to collaborate with them and I well I would say that for 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 different uh, personal reasons I felt it was time to go back to Poland and they offered me a job so I moved back to Poland and uh, after a while I kind of matured into uh, creating this first piece which was the first piece in Poland, you know, kind of going back to the father's land, mother's land, and and deciding, okay, I'm ready for it. And it was a piece about my my grandfather, um, and a pretty uh, you know tragic story of discovery that that he was uh, collaborating with the secret services for many many years. So that was the the beginning of it. Yes. Um, and I think already then in that first work here, I had this very clear notion that I'm completely not interested in kind of doing theater for the sake of doing theater, that I'm interested in, in trying things out, trying different formats, experimenting with what could theater be, um, and also not just to the idea is not to innovate, but the idea is really to to feel something, to feel that I'm that I'm living an experience, um, and not that I'm making yet another play. Uh, is it any correspondence with Grotowski ideas? Uh, well, for a very long time, I I would say that not at all. Uh, that it's as far from Grotowski as it can be, because I'm a I'm not at all a believer in the actor as the ultimate human, and I'm not interested in the in the experience of the one who is who is making the performance. I'm interested in the one who is seeing the performance. I'm interested in the event as this defined by the by the gaze of the spectator. Uh, so in that sense, it's it's extremely different. Uh, but as time goes by, I discover some affinities, you know, thinking about um, the spectacle and what it is and what is beyond it and a certain trying to get beyond the, the, the kind of surface of the spectacle. But I do enjoy the spectacle. So I think that makes me very, very different from Grotowski. You know, I, I, um, I enjoy good Hollywood uh, movies and... Um, I, I embrace the, the pop culture that I'm part of. Um, I don't feel completely, you know, an outsider to that. I think I feel more of an outsider to the theater world than to the world of uh, mainstream culture. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned uh, yes. Warszawa TR, and is it is it the same uh, as mentioned in your biography that you were uh, doing some experiments in Institut Tatrani uh, yeah, at the time? So what was the well? There were there were there was you know there were several places which uh, welcomed me. The the very first one was Ter Warszawa, which was a you know it's a city theater. Um, and they wanted me to create a, a video studio, which I was working on for nine months, but then they had a huge budget problem and they just cut the whole program. Um, so that was um, one side of, of my activity. Uh, but basically later then I kind of moved out of there and uh, and there was Institut Teatralne, which at the time was an extremely open place created by Maciej Novak, um, a very, I should say, important figure in, um, in, in Polish theater and who is quite open-minded. And at the time he was, he was just telling me, whatever you want to try, just try it. 
so I would start off by giving workshops and that was working quite well. So then I would make some some small pieces there, kind of experiments or, or use it as a as a stage where I would try things out uh, a few times. But then fairly quickly after I had the premiere of small narration, Komuna Warszawa, you know, invited me to to work there, Komuna Warszawa, which at the time was you know, an alternative space known by a fairly small group of people. Um, right now, it's one of the main spots in the in Warsaw, uh, in terms of uh, certainly in terms of independent theater. Um, but they just, you know, they said, "Why don't you try something here?" And and I did, and it worked quite well. And then they invited me again and again and again. So we we became quite uh, close. And that allowed me, you know, it was a it was a pretty luxurious um, a development, I would say, I, luxurious in terms of the conditions, because I was being hosted by institutions who would tell me whatever you want to try, go ahead. You know, there was no talk about audiences, uh, you know, the number of spectators, uh, repertory. Uh, none of this was was. Uh, um, was ever mentioned. So it was fairly late that I discovered that world. I knew it beforehand, but but, but uh, I didn't have that experience personally. And I only once I kind of established myself as an artist, I started being invited by these by these uh, uh, city theaters in different places. And suddenly they started mentioning the fact that, you know, we have actors and it would be great if you could use those actors and we have a repertory. So if you could make a piece for the repertory that could stay in the repertory, that would be great. And suddenly, or not set suddenly, but progressively, I, I was kind of sucked into that world. Gdzie my zmierzamy? Mamy dziś mówić o futurologii. Ja jestem tym przerażony. Terapia genowa to będzie terapia przyszłego człowieka. Może trochę dążymy do tego, żeby uciec śmierci. Wszechświat będzie coraz bardziej zimny i pusty, aż do ostatecznego, nieciekawego końca. Przecież nie można powiedzieć, żebyśmy przestali posiadać jakąś przyszłość. Przyszłość jest zawsze. Uh, as I read, it was a project as a, uh, where different artists were invited to reflect about the future. And uh, you invite a, a family of actors who is, uh, who is uh, yeah, whose surname is Pogox. And, and, and uh, yeah, Combania. So, uh, but the, the main in the scenography way, yeah, is a, not, not non-standard, it was because of the DJ set. Uh, so how was audience, they dance, uh, what it was for you and for audience? Um, it, I think it ended up by being a very standard situation, a very standard theater production in a way. Um, first of all, the invitation was to a program and I was not very happy about it because I'm not particularly interested in making shows about the future because I don't feel I'm competent. And the only thing that is worse for me than talking about the future is talking about the theater in the future. And that was the invitation. The invitation was what will the theater look like in a hundred years? Um, so, and I was also the first one to I think the first or this, I ended up being maybe the second, I'm not sure. But it was a, a, a very tricky uh, uh, place to be. And so we moved from very crazy, weird things with holograms and and smoke and and this kind of retro futur futuristic stuff um, to um, we narrowed it down because we discovered something which is, I mean, this is the way that I work. I, I go in deep into a process. Sometimes I have a very precise idea at the beginning, but then in the process it can change radically. 
So it changed radically when I asked Yashmina and Piotr, who are this uh, brother and sister uh, actor team, both amazing actors. Um, I asked them to bring, to talk to people about the future and to choose people who are close and who are far, who are from the family and who are from far away. And uh, they brought a conversation, Yashmina brought a conversation she had with her mother. And she said, I think I have something. And it was a completely crazy conversation where her mother would, for maybe 20 minutes, she had a monologue basically about how she's afraid about everything in the future. So she's afraid about the climate and the, and the, and the garbage and, and uh, illnesses and uh, people uh, hating each other and wars and like every possible thing you could fear, she named it. And it felt like, like a, a, an image of future that we all kind of carry with us, but, uh, but that is unbearable. And so the whole show in a way is a lighthearted attempt to answer that to find an answer to their mother. So to kind of, to, to liberate yourself from this burden that you're receiving from the older and wiser uh, generation, who of course is not wiser, but that is their kind of function. And so the way that we found of doing that was making a kind of a very modest and, and, and do-it-yourself concert where uh, Yashmin and Piotr were playing samples uh, that were fragments of the conversation and fragments of what the mother was saying. Uh, so they would, they would have a conversation with these samples and either they would reply to these samples or they would have samples talk to each other or they would make music with this, these samples. They were finding ways of turning something which is a very heavy perspective into something which can be you know beautiful or or joyful or or different and and it ended up being a kind of a dj set so that's why they they call it a dj set when of course it's a slightly there's an irony to that because hopefully the audience gets a bit more out of it than a than just an enjoyable concert uh, and it was a it became a repertoire uh, piece uh, uh, in the theater. Yes, yes, it 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 is. Uh, it it was going to be now uh, played uh, on the fifteenth, uh, but Yashmina couldn't because she's filming uh, something. So, um, but yeah, it's it's played fairly regularly. It was shown in the. Novit in the showcase that Novitat makes of the best theater of the past season. So it was shown there and uh, and it, uh, it was it was shown in, in Munich at the Kammerspiele. So uh, I'm, I think it was people found it, you know, new, appreciated, which I was very happy about because it was a super stressful um, end of the process because it's it's very fragile it's very it's very kind of it feels very grassroots or very kind of homemade and that is a terrain that i've never explored and it felt very awkward for a long time so i had to really understand how to work with such a material and such an atmosphere i always wanted to do it but suddenly when i found myself there it was, I felt like an idiot. So uh, it took a while to get there. Uh, I consider about, about this piece, you also in one of the interviews said that, said that uh, I want to find a place for fun or theater should be a place for fun, perversity, but not as uh, yeah, something that uh, inspired you to put yourself under the wheels of the current problems. Yes, well, there's a huge pressure in Poland to make uh, work that is uh, that is that participates in the public debate, but which is very a very narrow definition of that. So basically, it's 
there's a lot of work that I think just goes with whatever is, you know, the, whatever people talk about on Facebook right now, which usually has to do with politics and and uh, criticizing some aspect of the world we live in. Um, and you know, the further you push it, the the the, the better supposedly the the piece. Um, and that honestly, it bores the shit out of me. It's just I. I don't deal with it very well. I think it's, uh, first of all, the audience that comes to see those shows is not an audience that can learn anything from that. Second of all, I doubt that it has any sort of impact. Uh, third of all, when it even does have an impact, like in the famous uh, Felich piece, Klontfa, yes, the curse, um, it's debatable whether the impact is a positive impact. So it, it, it's very easy to antagonize others. Uh, that is, it's a very simple thing to do. But the question is, can you build a, a community? Can you build, you know, a, a, a force, a power? Can you build a, a something which is affirmative? And for that, I think that is more tricky. And and one of the ways of doing that is is. Um, enjoyment is, is building situations of enjoyment, which I think I, I miss that aspect of theater, which is not, it's not about making stupid work. It's not about, you know, making it easy. It's about really enjoyment, about fun as in, as in something that, that gives you a pleasure to assist. Uh, and I think, you know, that, kind of, I think probably it stayed with me from my childhood, watching all these things. And I was watching, you know, shows for adults when I was a kid. Uh, so those were not shows for children. Of course, I also watched shows for children, but there was a lot of shows for adults that were just kind of finding a world that would be engaging and, 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 um, and where I wanted to stay and where people wanted to stay. So, so this, I think, it's not that I do that with every piece, but I think there should be a space for that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we are, uh, uh, came to the moment of uh, end of full screen, where I can see the year in community work and political, uh, but how you get this idea uh, to, to do a set a piece in Zoom online, what, what was your, your, your way uh, since the uh, lockdown when we saw that it's yeah, for a couple of weeks and then we, everything would come back? My colleagues were about half and half. Half of them were saying this was going to last a week and the other half was saying this will be forever. Uh, we will all die and there's no solution and, you know, um, or maybe there was a smaller group, but they were quite loud. So, um, so I didn't have the impression that that would be a very short while. That was the first thing. But the second was, uh, I've, I've done my share of experiments in theater with, you know, making, uh, interactive walks and, and, uh, in video installations and, uh, um, all sorts of environments and, and, and different kind of experiences that I consider theater. And so when, when this happened, I moved to the internet. I, I teach um, at Warsaw University and at the um, National Academy, Theatrical Academy, sorry, in Warsaw. So uh, basically I moved online very quickly and I found it immediately to be uh, quite um, inspiring, actually. Um, just because I always look for new ways of, of communicating or of, of being together or of defining what um, aesthetic experience is. So that was a, a new experience and I was very happy to go there with my students. Um, and I actually had the experience where we I had a group that I that I taught for half a year offline and then we moved online 
and we all felt that the online got us much further and we were much closer and it was a much better course than what we were doing offline. So, so I had a pretty good idea that this is a universe which, which has quite a lot of potential. And that the things that I'm doing during the classes that we are actually discovering new worlds. And so I was thinking, okay, I need to find just a, a situation where I can use it. And I knew that I had this show that I'd been, you know, thinking about for the last, for the, for one year before, because it, it was planned like two years ahead. Um, the show with an international cast. Um, and it's, for me, it was a very theatrical situation because I got, you know, six actors who are defined as actors from, from three or four theaters. And they're actually, you know, they're employed in theaters as actors. And, and this is a program for theater directors to make plays, to, to make shows with them. Uh, but it's clearly defined already. So I was always a bit nervous about this situation. It's not that I'd never done it, but every time I, I have this very theatrical situation, I really have to prepare well. And here suddenly there's the lockdown, the first lockdown, and everyone is saying, okay, this is going to calm down in the summer already and they're assuming that we are all going you know they're all hopeful that it's all going to pass uh but i i'm thinking well it may or it may not but right now i'm in a situation where i can't really do anything with them um physically which i wanted to i wanted to have a f first few rehearsals and then they're all over the place they're in different places and i wanted to do this internet thing I might just as well use this opportunity to try it. Uh, so I proposed that and all the theaters were like, oh, what a relief because they were all, you know, hope they were all optimistic on the surface, but deep, deep down, we all knew, you know, if you think about it deep down, we all knew that this was not going to be an easy time so for them it was to have somebody propose it not as a as a compromise but as an artistic proposition was a huge relief uh, that was not the case with the actors uh, so most of the actors didn't really enjoy being on the internet when we met first met uh, two of them had never ever been on zoom before one of them has never had a Skype or any sort of video conference situation like we're having now um, and didn't even have a computer. So I had a group which was not necessarily going to kind of universally um, enjoy helping me with inventing things, but that would require a lot of my input. But I said, okay, well, fine, we'll try it. Um, and we start, started off with really cool rehearsals. It was really like the beginning was really awesome. They were all, their minds were blown. We were like, oh, we can be together in so many fantastic ways. And it was great. But the process was a bit too long. I planned it too long because I didn't, I underestimated the fact that the Zoom fatigue would now everyone knows very well. I thought that if the material would be interesting and the process would be interesting that we would just enjoy doing it. And I had, you know, seven, sometimes seven hour rehearsals, which is, I'm embarrassed to say it now, you know. Um, and it lasted for, I think, three months, four months with breaks. So several weeks and then several weeks of pause and then several weeks again. Um, and that allowed us to, to really go deep and to really find the territory that I was interested in. Uh, but on the other hand, it, it meant that several, it, well, one actor for sure and, and two others to some extent had really enough. Like they really thought that that was ridiculous.
the, the amount of time that we spent on it was exactly the same as we would on a big theater production. And here they had like, you know, a few lines saying this and that and clicking on a few things and that's it. So it didn't, you know, it was difficult for them to treat it as seriously um, as the theater production. But all in all, I think what happened was this, this was a, um, an opportunity which I, which I used to kind of say, okay, let's try and invent something which is going to be so very specific for Zoom that you will be happy to be experiencing it on Zoom. You will be, so that once you watch it, you will think like, wow, what a, I'm so happy that Zoom exists because that allowed me to have this experience, which I wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, and that was the, the, the essential starting point. And because we had that time, I think it allowed us to really deliver, you know, to really treat it very seriously and not just as a, uh, you know, series of effects that you can use. Once upon a time, there was a boy. His name was Yanni, Jan. But people call me Yannick. But people called him Yannick. So for, for me, uh, it seems that this uh, yeah, combination of offline and uh, online that one of the uh, uh, that one of the actors is uh, researching, working, have this uh, tour offline uh, in, uh, in this potentially dangerous situation. Mm, and this, uh, this online became additional layers to, to the reality. Uh, what was, uh, yeah, you initially have this uh, feeling that it it uh, should be some yeah, combination of offline and online, uh, or or you experiment with different forms. It's interesting that you should call it offline, where actually he is still online. It's just that he is not home. Uh, but we are so now used to the fact that we are online when we are home, and when we leave home, we go offline. That even if he is you know with the phone but but with us it feels like he's offline um that was it came in fairly late um for a very long time we were just all stuck with our screens um but i think that 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 it, it's like a small step like a small click that suddenly builds a different a, a new universe and opens up all the other possibilities um, and that happened because um, I, we were working on different ideas and, and schemes. Um, and at a certain point, there was a, a, some articles about the LGBT free zones. And I clicked on something which I knew about, of course, before, but I clicked on the map and I realized that it's all over Poland, you know, that these these uh, districts or regions or or towns which declared themselves you know they didn't declare themselves lgbt free but they declared themselves free of lgbt ide ideology and that, that there there's lots of them and i had thought there were maybe two or three so it was such a shock for me that i thought well i can't just it's too much for me i have to i have to i have to see if we can't somehow explore that so and i my first idea was well okay well let's send somebody there and let him just be there and we won't do anything he'll just be there and all the rest will happen around it whatever and and so i sent yannick uh there and uh, the other thing which i noticed was that there was a one lgbt free zone which is really close to Warsaw. It's not super close. I hoped it was closer <laughs> for the sake of the production, um, but it was like 40, min 40 minutes away. So uh, Yannick went, uh, went there and the experience was haunting. It was really, 
like we made this test and the very first test was so creepy that he didn't need to do anything he was just walking and filming and it was like oh i'm scared stop um and i you know i had a big crisis because i thought like okay we don't need anybody else we don't need anything else we just need this one guy with the phone walking through the town and telling us where he is and anything we will see will make us just freak out um so there was the crisis of that and then i i tried okay so let's have a conversation with him and the actors were having conversations and it was terrible because they were fake i mean they were interesting for the first time but when they were trying it again and asking the same questions i was like well how can i believe you you know i i just recently saw a thing by 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 rimini protocol it's called uh, calcutta um at home um and my huge problem there, as often with Rimini Protocol and often with documentary theater, is that you hear it's documentary for me is supposed to give you this kind of feeling of reality. But when it's interpreted, when it's, you know, repeated, then of course the reality is gone. You're, you're doing mim mimetic theater once again. It's, it doesn't matter if you're Hamlet or if you're, yourself but if you're if you're saying the same line for the 10th time then and having a conversation pretending that you're curious to know something when you already know it that is really weird so i have this big problem and it was really a problem because i couldn't deal with it like everyone was happy about it because they all enjoy theater and i was looking at it and i was like no i can't listen to this this is terrible you know, you're telling him about this place or asking him or whatever you're saying, it just feels like you're faking it. And in parallel, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a gadget freak. So I, I like to explore all sorts of things. And I, one of the things I discovered was that it was a, a very recent thing that you could put Snapchat masks on Zoom. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. And I, I had the actors try it out and they fell in love with it completely. They were, you know, because it's so theatrical and it suddenly allows you to have fun and play. And of course we all love, love the Snapchat masks. So, um, so I tried it and then I tried having them have a conversation and suddenly it clicked because suddenly if you're a character then of course you can repeat the conversation. Then of course you can ask all the questions because you're fiction and fiction is of course fiction. So you can repeat it. It's not a problem. Um, you know, I suspend my disbelief. Um, and so that was, that was really the defining moment. These, these two moments, the first one of sending him somewhere and realizing that it's so powerful to have somebody like on a mission, you know, like he's on a mission to Mars um and the second one which was which was the introduction of the of the of the snapchat characters uh, and then of course well the rest there was still a lot of work around it to define what does it mean that there's a character do, do, do they act do they not act do they talk as themselves do they switch characters do they have the same character do they have many um there was a lot of decisions in the meantime but this this crucial thing, I think that was that was it. Uh, yeah, I would like to mention that uh, in o o prose, uh in the in the final after the after the performance, it was existed, but in this dig digital form as a sound from one of the uh, yes participants pre-recorded, and uh, what what other yeah, as we research in a laboratory is that you need some some preparation yeah it's so easy to change from one window to another then uh, to, to concentrate participants viewers you need you need something that in this performance you have a zoom introduction yeah uh, maybe what was the response for this uh, for this piece yeah how wide uh, audience uh, watch it 
Um, I don't know the, the exact numbers, but I know that it was quite popular. It was, you know, one of the amazing things was that we had, you know, we try to have after every performance, so far we su we've succeeded after every performance, we have a conversation, whoever wants to stay, stays and has a conversation. And I consider it part of the show actually, because it gives you a, a closer contact with reality. It makes, it kind of grounds this fictional work in an actual reality much more. Uh, and, you know, we had, I remember we had one of the when this third or fourth uh, showing there was like one person from Italy talking and then right after somebody from Iran and then right after uh, somebody from the US and then right after and it was like one person after another commenting and it was and you, and I was thinking okay that is exactly the dream that I thought was impossible you know it's this situation where you have like people sitting in completely different universes it's not even that it's us and france it's it was really iran and and um, i don't remember what other place but i i remember that the, when iran popped up i was like okay i thought i'd seen it all but now wow um which of course is silly why shouldn't somebody from iran watch it is but he's just not on my you know, map of even distant acquaintances, and 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 I've never been to Iran with any show. Um, I've never seen a programmer from Iran come to any of my shows, so that was really a unique experience for me. And somebody from Switzerland as well, so this kind of combination of you know these really weird things. So that was quite something. Um, and I, you know, there, there were several people who thought it was really a very important piece for them because it was, uh, I think it's the combination of exploring in a fun way Zoom, which you think is impossible because you think like, okay, there's nothing to explore more really, we're, we're done. Um, so kind of discovering that you can enjoy Zoom and at the same time, uh, going into the LGBT free zone, which if you're Polish, you know pretty well, but if you're not Polish, you're not going to be aware that this happens. And I have, you know, uh, I remember I, I got an email after a, a few weeks from somebody who, uh, who was in high school with me in Canada, because I was living in Canada for a while. And I haven't seen him since then. And I sent him an email before because I thought like, oh, well, he could theoretically, he could see it. And he did. And he did. And he said he was super impressed. He loved it. And that he had no idea about the LGBT free zones. And now he's been following that and, and checking it out. And, and it's uh, crazy and, and scary and, and impressive. So, so that was really, in that sense, it felt like what I was talking about before, which is that this, this, this need, I also have that, this need of participating in the world and of, you know, uh, referring to important political and social things happening around you. Um, so it's not as if I'm not part of that universe, I am. When I was saying later, earlier on that there's a pressure, I think the pressure is to do it all the time and to just define your work through that. And this I have a problem with, but hopefully in this piece, you know, I had, for instance, I remember somebody saying that for them, the the piece is not about the LGBT free zones, that they're a case study, but it's really about how we can use tools like Zoom to be together or not, and how to, can we really be somewhere else? And can we really do, like, does it really change something that I'm watching a situation like that? Um, and I do think that this is the, kind of the the core of that of that work um, it uses the case of that uh, of that story but it's not uh, it, I, I I hope it doesn't the audience doesn't feel like they just close in on that and there's nothing but that uh, we are uh, we are fastly uh, coming to one hour that we uh, 
Great, yeah. And I have some questions more about this topic and uh, our laboratories that yeah, for half year spent the other time together. For me, it was condensed in one sentence that uh, if you're on a stage, uh, actor is is fragile, yeah, or at least if he's not, if he's close, then then you couldn't believe. And for me, it was uh, inside that in uh, in Zoom, yeah, on a screen, person also could be fragile. And then it creates some situation where I could, as a, a viewer, participant, connect and, and feel some empathy. Mm, what you you provide yeah, many many workshops. What what is your findings uh, from uh, yeah, from different groups and uh, yeah, how to overcome a Zoom fatigue? Uh... Um, well, I think some of the things that have been told said about theater for many many years and which have become a bit trivial. Uh, suddenly can apply also to to the zoom situation and it's a little bit along the lines of what you're saying which is that if you can find a, a kind of human connection and discover that there's a real person um, then suddenly you're not tired suddenly then you feel that something is happening that's important because you realize that you're not watching a screen that you're watching a person and if you if that person manages to have you go somewhere with that that is i think that is something which is a little bit crazy it feels like alchemy you know it feels like how is that possible uh, a little bit like when we watch a film and we cry and we go like how can i be crying to this but here you don't jump out because there's a real person so there's no catharsis there's no turning off you turn it off and you still think like yeah, that person there, this thing that they showed me, it was really, it really moved me, touched me, made me think about the world, about others. Um, I, I made recently this piece called Sex for, for it was uh, in Brno, but it was actually online with six writers writing texts on a, on a Google spreadsheet. Um, and they were just doing that for an hour and a half. Uh, but the experience that you can get of reading somebody who's writing live and you know that they're writing live and you see the thought and see them build this world, uh, it's really crazy because it really feels like you can go into somebody's head suddenly thanks to this weird thing, distance. Um, so I think a lot of the good things in this situation that we are in are about discovering other ways of meeting other minds. Uh, yeah, it's very provoking that it's uh, it's unclear and uh, uh, why why you choose such a title uh, for six authors. Well, it was. It was, I would say, literally a provocation in the sense of trying to create, to push towards a situation. Um, uh, yes, I, I thought it was the thing that was the most, uh, that felt like the most impossible in the situation. Because yes, we can think of virtual sex to some extent, but we all know that sex is not virtual that it's real, that it's a body, that it's the touch of a body. Uh, it can be my own body, it can be somebody else's body, but the, we need the body, we need the flesh. And that is the thing that we miss the most, that I miss the most, that for me is the most unnatural. Any meeting that I have even right now with people has this awkwardness of distance. And you, you know, you know we, we bump the, the fist because we can't resist. We know that it's, it's stupid. It's it, between this and this, come on, there's no difference. But we do it because it's like, okay, well, we get a little bit of something of the other 
you know. Uh, so we're not rational beings that are kind of going, okay, yeah, I, I, I understand what you mean. And so you can be my friend. No, we want a hug from our friend. That's how we get friendly. Uh, so, so in a way it was, it was going at the very core of what we're missing and saying, and now we're going to build it from scratch. We're going to build it just from the imagination. We're going to work just on you imagining this sensual real world. Uh, and in a sense, it's not at all about sex because the writers didn't choose it to be about explicitly about sex. Uh, some of them did a bit more than others, but the main thing that they did was they built this, this world of sensual pleasure that we can get. And we get it through a form which seems the most distance possible, which is, you know, a spreadsheet. You think Excel can give you sensual pleasure oh my god uh and and they do it and they they i thought they they succeeded and i was you know super impressed by by what they achieved so um but it's of course it's trying to see what are the how can we how can we experience the world in a different way but that still works with us that still makes us feel uh, and I'm, I'm not saying that this is the solution. I'm just saying that this is literally research. It's lit, li literally searching for something and 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 diving in it. You see, even when I go diving in it, I I check the camera so my hands get bigger. This kind of thing that the experience becomes something else, but so that you can feel a bit more. So then normally I would probably go something like this or like this, but here intuitively I'm already participating in this new language game of, okay, here we go. Uh, what, what's your opinion about uh, recordings of uh, such performances? Yeah, if, uh, it it was live and then it recorded and then we yeah, broadcast it. It's a big topic. Um, I'll 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 maybe answer with an anecdote. Um, when I was in Lisbon, when I was living in Lisbon, there was a a meeting with a with a very famous uh, art curator called Delphine Sardou. It was in this super big um, theater hall in, in Lisbon. Um, and I arrived late and it was full. So there were no more seats, but there was a group of about 15 people or maybe 20 who, uh, who arrived late as I did and we all wanted to participate. And so they put us in you know how you have when you enter a, the a theater hall very often there are two doors before the entrance so there's one door then there's a small space kind of in between space and then there's the other door so they put us in this in between space which was about maybe five meters by five 15 people packed and we didn't see even the the, the stage or anything and we had one big tv and on it, we didn't see the actual view of the stage. What we saw was the presentation, the PowerPoint presentation that Delphine Sardo was doing. So we were just seeing the slides and we had the sound. And it lasted for about two hours. It was terribly hot. There was no air conditioning. It was difficult to breathe. We were all sitting there, 15 of us, not a single person left. It wasn't particularly fa fascinating as a, it was, it was a good uh, lecture about art history, but it wasn't mind blowing. The 15 of us were sitting there in the worst possible conditions, watching the screen with the presentation and listening to the sound. And I kept thinking, why are we doing this? If I could, I could go back home and I'm sure it was recorded and I could ask them for a recording or go online and watch it whenever I would have the time. But there was something about the liveness of the event, about the fact of me being conscious that it's happening now, 
that made it worthwhile sitting there and experiencing this really weird thing for all of us. And so I think that, first of all, that liveness is in your head, that it's something that when you're convinced that this is what is happening, it happens. Second of all, I think it's something which is very deeply ingrained in humanity, where liveness gives you something. And it may be really actually stupid, because on a rational level, it's much better to watch when you have the right conditions to watch, when you can sit at home and, and play the recording. But there is something in us which, which, go, which tells us that, no, 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 it is really important that we be here. And I don't know if it's you know, evolutionary uh, atavistic. I, I don't really know what is it about it, but I think that it's there. Um, and then I do think that there's a certain pleasure of actually providing that type of experience. And so those theaters, you know, there's so many shows that were performances that were recorded and then they were, they were shown online saying that it's a live premiere, which I thought was like, how, how, much, more, how much more stupid can you be than a theater that is calling live something which is recorded. Like if you're a theater, you don't want people to start believing that it doesn't matter if something is recorded or is live because everything that theater has been about until now is about liveness. It's about the fact that it's worth seeing something for real. So if you're showing a recording, say that it's a recording. Don't say that it's a live premiere because it's, it just makes you look ridiculous. Uh, this being said, I do think that there's many shows that don't lose anything in being seen as a recording. And that especially if you define something as a recording, if you're thinking about it as a recording, that's fine, that's a, a separate piece. But I do think that there's a specific pleasure that we, we as humans uh, gain from witnessing something happen live even if we could see it as a recording afterwards and technically it wouldn't change anything. Great, thank you. Uh, so it's now time for questions for, for our, our other uh, participants, guests here. Perhaps if you have some questions, now you could ask them. While you are thinking uh, uh, that it is a final question about the future of the theater, yeah, in 2018, you, you, you thought about this, yeah, you, you prayed with it, and now you have experience of, of this. Uh, yeah, the, the, uh, trying to keep uh, yeah, this fun and perversity uh, with, with such feelings. Uh, if, if you ask yourself about the next and next uh, performances and uh, what could be next for you, uh, go, going into v, VR, like in getting to yeah, record actors with, uh, uh, with different uh, devices. I, I don't consider my work as a progression that goes kind of further and further into some sort of experiment, technical or formal. Um, and, you know, I was, after having made several pieces that were very strongly based on technology, I, I started being invited to different conferences and, and to teach uh, classes around media and the stage. And that was exactly the time when I made like three or four pieces that didn't have a single, uh, you know, video or projection or anything, because that didn't it didn't work that way for me. But you're very quickly tagged as this or that, so I don't I don't think about it in these categories. But I do think of like going deeper into some sort of experience. This yes. Um, but I also have Zoom fatigue, and I'm also, you know, uh, looking forward to to trying things with bodies that are actually physically <laughs> in the same space as I am. Uh, so I don't know if if 
in the nearest future, I'll be doing many things online. Um, I, I do know that there's a lot more to explore for sure. Um, and I do know one thing which I'm, I've been thinking about recently quite a lot, which is that it's strange that the things that went online, they didn't move towards the mainstream in any way. So, you know, the, the biggest success I've witnessed in terms of audience was a show by Varlikovsky that had a premiere online or maybe it wasn't a premiere, online premiere, whatever. Um, and I think they had 8,000 viewers, which you think like, wow, for a theater performance, that's incredible. But then you think, okay, that's for an online show to have 8,000 people watching, that's okay. I mean, that's, that's okay. But if you think that this is the, you know, the biggest, name currently in in theater that is ridiculous it's ridiculous uh, and all these experiments that were made you know online zoom whatever is some of them moving you know towards twitch and 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 other forms of uh, um uh of connecting connecting to gaming and in, in one way or another we're all working in completely niche uh, you know, tiny, tiny, for tiny audiences, uh, which has always been the law because there's always this kind of um, tacit acceptance that, uh, you know, the visual arts don't need almost any audience. Uh, there can be three people and that's not a problem. Uh, in theater, you need about a hundred people and then you move to cinema and suddenly you need thousands and, and, and more. Um, but I was, I was, it's it's always something that made me quite curious. And I know that there were attempts of, of going mainstream and I don't know if anyone's, maybe you do, but I don't know anyone's that actually succeeded that, that made these online forms work for a bigger audience. Um, and I find that curious. And I think it, there's, there's a lot to, to dig into there because I think it it says something about uh, of course society and and what the audiences want but also what they can find and how they find it and how we define what we do uh, how we how we choose to present it ourselves and where and using what tools um, and actually I wonder, why it's like that. And if there's not a certain need to stay this isolated universe, and I'm not very happy about that. So, so I'm part of it, but uh, I have these, you know, thoughts of like, well, not going mainstream, but opening up and, and seeing if there's not, like now that we're all online, you can't have the excuse of being in a, in a you know, a lost garage somewhere in the outskirts of the city or in a, a municipal theater where only a few selected people go. No, you're online, you, you could be, you know, and I've seen theaters putting ads of their shows on Facebook. So, so they're aware of that, it's, but it's not enough. It's not enough. And the question is, do we really want to be part of that society fully? And if so, what can we do about it? And I think it's a it's a very interesting um, thought and and uh, kind of challenge to have. I believe uh, your your thoughts, uh, at, at least for me, was inspiring and uh, you're making wider open up some words and experience and uh, yeah, some uh, good feelings Thank and. Op opening up, uh, yes, uh, again, uh, the, the participants. Uh, it's now time for you if you wish to have some questions to Wojtek. Yes, hello. I'm thankful for your Hi. talk. Hello. Thank you. It was very interesting to listen to your conversation. And uh, I 
uh, know you by watching the performance with the guest. <clears throat> and I uh, like it very much. And uh, as, yes, it was very good. I, I see it uh, live and I see it online. <laughs> so in that case, I think that, that it exists online is very helpful. For example, uh, I am teaching in the university, so I can show it my students, actors and theater critics. And it was great to discuss about it. And really thank you for this work, this job. Uh, for me, it was opening that uh, world of people with uh, that kind of life. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> the language, it, it was brilliant the idea with language, with him, they were singing and it's really moved when they start singing that him <laughs> and he was all in the audience, he was standing. Oh, wow, it was really like in that silence, I have a feeling like we are singing some national hymn, so it's really great. And uh, I you. like your. I get the shivers when you're when you're describing it because I I remember it, and it was also for me a, a moving moment. Mm -hmm. Yes, and the the, the poetry which they made uh, it was too uh, so. It's really this performance online. It was very big gift for us. Uh, we unfortunately can participate sometimes with some project in Poland. I try to, to get online, but uh, because of uh, countries, because of pay, pay, we can't pay from the other countries. So it's a problem, but mm -hmm. still, I, I hope <laughs> will uh, be a moment when we come, can come and see or hear uh, your project again. And welcome to Ukraine. I think uh, you can find so many other interesting people who can Participate. I, I hope you will find some good people to be interesting for you for your work. Um, yeah, so just thankful. Thank and, you. Um, Thank you. Please, please uh, feel free to contact me directly if you want. Uh, you know, I have some some other recordings if you're interested. Mm -hmm. um, that's one thing. Another is I would love to go to Ukraine uh, for many reasons. Uh, of course, one of them is the, the family reason we started off with um, and the fact that I never went to Lviv or Lviv. I've never been there as I'm the only member of my family who's never been there, um, uh, which I think is a little bit maybe an unconscious way of, of kind of having to mature into this idea. Mm -hmm. um, but I would really love to, to go there. I, I, I've been... Uh, to Kiev, and it was a great experience, uh, uh, mm. and on the outskirts of Kiev as well. So um, I would really, Ukraine is is uh, one of my my kind of important places for me. Mm. So I'm really happy to hear that um, that uh, you also know my work because uh, that that makes it even more special. I know you because I was studying two years on theater pedagogy in Warsaw University. <laughs> and I one, see. One of my friends have a you like a tutor. <laughs> and, uh -huh. So it's uh, yes, we talking about you a lot. And uh, in Viva, oh. I'm a working university like a theater critic, and I try to to bring some idea from theater pedagogy to our university. So uh, if you, yes, I will happy to, to show you city, <laughs> show you, Thank you. Uh, our university, our department of uh, art. So, yeah. Thank um, you so much. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll have to really uh, consider it very seriously because it's high time, you know, My, I have enough white hair now to, <laughs> to I think, be okay. able to, to, to go there. <laughs> So thank, yeah, thank you. you, thank you very much. Thank you too. Uh, I can just quickly say that the scene from One Gesture, so One Gesture or Yedan Guest, which was a show made with deaf performers, and uh, what uh, you were just describing uh, as the scene where um, the, the, the performers um, sign or sing together by signing a hymn that they invented a hymn of the deaf. Um, and that was, it was probably the, one of the most important scenes I've ever made. 
um, and it was a uh, after a long process of working with them and and reading about the deaf and and I I got to know them quite well, and I realized that they don't really have anything that unites them. That is that is a common culture, which is you know uh, very for us it's almost unconceivable that you wouldn't have a, a poem that everybody knows or a song or uh, something like that. Uh, and so I proposed this to them. I, I said, well, okay, why don't we come up with something? And they said, okay. And we had to, it was quite a lot of work to get there, but, but we had different teams. Uh, each team had a, uh, had one or two uh, of the deaf performers plus the interpreter plus somebody who's uh, hearing and they were we we're all do, doing research about hymns and all writing writing or inventing composing their version of the hymn and then we all got together and they all discussed that and it took probably a few days to get to some sort of uh, consensus and then they would still change the vocabulary it was quite a quite a, a kind of intense uh, process uh, but the the wonderful happy ending to this is that there are several schools for the deaf around the world who have actually used this hymn as something that they teach their students and that was uh, the moment when you know art turns reality and when you feel humbled by the, by the whole experience um yes <laughs> thank you <laughs>